listening to the Celtic Coach Radio Show, an Irish talk show for men and all things manly, coming to you from our new and improved studios in downtown Sebastopol, California, IA, 92.5 FM, if you're driving around in your car today, which I know quite a people, few people called in and said they'd be listening on the, uh, on the car today. So uh, please listen responsibly and, and, and for God's sake, stay safe. Uh, this content could go anywhere on the show today. And if you're listening on the website at kows.fm, F for Frank, M for Matilda. That's the only special effects you'll ever hear on the show is a cow bell. I know, we're very technical here. All right, our next guest. Oh, boy. Let me, uh, I'm going to bring him through the board first just to make sure that he can hear me. So hold on a second. Uh, Steve, are you, are you hearing me all right? Yes, I am. All right, let me just hang up the phone here. All right, our next guest. Oh boy, this this guy is uh, he he's as busy as they come. Uh, life coach, author, speaker, popular guest on radio and TV. He's been working for at least twenty years with working with professionals in every area of business and professional and personal development. Uh, he's authored thirty two books, and uh, I say only thirty two books because I mean. Only 32, Steve? That's you got to get more well, organized you know, with your time, Steve. It's the d- definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, <laughs> hoping for a different result. Yeah, I think, though, uh, that might be a, a, a positive definition of that. Uh, yeah. Our next guest has been called the most powerful public speaker in America today. And if that's not good enough, this man happens to own a Detroit Tigers baseball cap worth 44 grand. Yes, That's a powerful cap for a big head. (laughs) If the writer Isaac uh, Asinoff, Monty Python, and and, uh, uh, Batman had a baby, Steve Chandler would be it. Isaac Asinoff for the prolific writing abilities, Monty Python for the quick wit, and always looking on the bright side of life. And Batman for... Actually, I'm going to take out Batman. I'm going to put in Steve Hardison for just doing it now and getting the job done. Ladies and gentlemen, put your virtual hands together for this week's guest, Mr. Steve Chandler. Hello, sir. Thank you very much, Dermot. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Very glad to have you, Steve. Uh, we uh, a lot of people calling in the show. Do you know what's interesting, Steve? Now, b- before we get into the into the stew of it all, uh, a lot of people say to me, uh, and maybe you can speak to this, but they say to me, Dermot, how in the hell did you get Steve Chandler on your show? And I think it comes back to something you talk about in your books, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, uh, a few of your books today, but uh, more so the book right now. And uh, I say uh, I say you know I just asked him, do do you find that that people are are surprised when when you say yes to things? Yes, I do, and I, I learned that from the person you mentioned as Batman, Steve Hardison that we can ask for anything in the world, and the worst thing that can happen is someone says, not right now. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, and it's one of the things, Steve, that I've learned for myself in doing the show that, you know, I've had a lot of just people that, I, that I've read their books and, I, and I've followed for years, and uh, I've been doing this show now for, the, for about five years. And uh, when I started five years ago, I had maybe about two or three people listening. And uh, I mean, now we're up to, I don't know, there's got to be at least five or six. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's progress. But uh, it, it never ceases to amaze me. The people that I, that I send an email and say, hey, would you like to come on the show? And I say, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to. So I, I love that part of, I love that part of the guests. And, and, and I appreciate that part of you, Steve. To me, you seem like a, I think I relate to you because you're, you seem just like an, like an ordinary Joe, Steve. And I don't, I don't mean that, you know, disrespectfully. But you just seem no, to be an average uh, lad that's that, trying to, you know, gotten through the mud. That's not hard for me to fake, being ordinary. Uh, that was an easy role to play. And so I, I decided to play that role from a very early age. Yeah. And how do you, how do you look at your ordinariness now? Well, it's the same. I, I've, uh, everybody I know... And most people I know of do good work in this world. And sometimes it's writing books and giving talks, and sometimes it's having a a wonderful radio show that inspires people. 
and is a welcome relief from the bad news that the media is feeding them. So uh, I think uh, I think everybody does great work. So and 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 great work can be ordinary in the sense that ordinary people can do it. Yeah, I like that. I I I'm remembering the quote. Um, oh gosh, of course I'm gonna I'm gonna kill it. But basically, Gandhi was saying that that great change and great things comes from the grassroots. It comes from ordinary people, you know, doing uh, ordinary things. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a Do you have like a a philosophy for life that you that you live by, Steve? You know, uh, is I do, but it changes from day to day, <laughs> depending on who you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, depending on what inspires me and uh, what I've read or what music I've listened to. I I love the Eva Cassidy you just played, mm. and uh, so. Yeah, I get it from all over. I get inspiration from all over. So I don't have a a central philosophy that I can think of. Maybe I should maybe I should get one for radio shows. <laughs> yeah, just in case they ask you, you know. Yeah, I make it up. I uh, well, you know what's interesting now. I I uh, I loved your book, and by the way, you owe me a a physical copy of the book, Steve. Okay. Um, because you said you were going to send it, and uh, uh, I I realized last week it wasn't in the mail, so I went out and got it on. Uh, on uh, what do you call that? The tablet thing, not the audible. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah like the Kindle reader the Kindle, yeah. or the yeah. And, and I read it, and it was really interesting because I came up with this little, I suppose you'd call it a mantra for my life, and it was based on 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 something that you said in the book, and something that I had noticed from. Uh, uh, now, is Steve Hardison? Is he still your life coach? Oh, absolutely, lifetime con- contract. All right. And you know, um, if he's listening, which he may well be, I I want to make sure that he hears me apologize to you for not having that book arrive like I said it would. One of the primary things he taught me over the years was to always be your word. Mm. And if I, I said I was sending you a book and you didn't get it, I owe you a major apology. That's, that's not the right way to live. Mm. And uh, that'll... That'll go out today. Oh, thank you, Steve. Wow, wow. So that's that, that's that's living. That's uh, walking your talk, Steve. Well, and cleaning it up when you when you're not walking your talk. Yeah. I think that's an important thing. Uh, amends and apologies uh, return you back to the present moment, so you can get on with your life. Mm. Wow. We, we we could close the show there, Steve, and you could just take that little piece and you could live a great life by it. Well, and, you know, I thank you for the work you do. It It's so great to be able to drive around or listen to the radio at home while doing some work and hear things that are uplifting and inspiring, hopefully, which our conversation might be. And it's it's such a positive thing to do in the world. Yeah, I, 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 well, I get a big kick out of it, Steve. And, and one of the things that I see, oh, oh, here, I just wanted to finish that thought now, just to, uh, and then we'll go to that. But I started, uh, I, I, I emailed Steve Hardison, uh, and uh, no, I emailed him after you, <laughs> and uh, I said, "Listen, would you would you be interested in coming on the show?" And he sent me back this beautiful email with with some some pictures and a book. And like all sorts of things, like inspirational uh-huh. stuff, you know. And I have to say, Steve, I, 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 I'm kind of choking about it now. It, it, the, the, the care that he took in, in, in sending an email back to someone that he knew nothing about, mm-hmm. that in itself, I have to say, really struck me. And what I got from it was, Dermot, whatever you do, you know, make it magical. That's what I got from his emails. And then I read your book right now, Mastering the Beauty of the Present Moment. Uh, and just a beautiful, beautiful book. It, it, the book is kind of like a poem, to be honest with you, Steve. I read it like a poem because it just started, had a beautiful middle, and it ended. Even though it was different content, different subjects, I still just 
it was, I, I was like on a surfboard. I just, I just kind of surfed through the pages, you know, and, 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 and every now and then I'd stop and reflect on something that you were, you were saying in there. But the biggest thing that's, that struck me was this idea, and, and I think you said it came from uh, uh, your coach, Steve Hardison, uh, right now, do it right now. And so I came up with this little quote. It simply says, do it now, make it magical, Dermot. Would, would you wow. tell a little bit about, you know, right now? Why is it so important right now, Steve, as opposed to we all like to do things, you know, manana? <laughs> yeah, in the future, yeah. when I'm ready, when situations are perfect, um, when I'm confident enough, yes. Yes. when I've resolved my personal issues, uh, we do. We and I, and I spent most of my life um, living in the future instead of living in in the present moment. And when I met Steve Hardison, uh, when I would describe to him something I wanted to do someday, he would always say, "Let's do that right now. You don't have to wait." And that that startled me. You know, I wasn't ready for that. And. Um, but it changed how I lived, and it, it changed my life. And I, I really saw that everything great gets created in the present moment, and the future gets created in the present moment. It doesn't get created in the future. And that was a big shift for me, and I saw that anyone could do it. It didn't take superhuman-type person. Anyone could pick up on that method of living. Yeah, I have a I have a quote here uh, uh, from from Steve Hardison. You've got to. Uh, it's in your book. You got to, you've got to pull things from the future. You can't leave them out there. Now is the best time. Yes. Yeah. Now, now, just being the advocate for the listeners out there, Steve. Some people might be thinking like, "Well, you know, I've got a lot to do. I can't just be running off chasing me dreams, or I can't be, you know, I have an idea uh, to." Uh, you know, to write a book or, or create a band or change my job, but I can't do it because I've got bills to pay. Well, well I'm sure, and I'm sure you have clients like that being a coach. Well, what do you say to those clients when they say stuff like that to you? Well, um, if they're my client, I might say, well, when would you like to write your book? Mm. Well, I'd like to write it sometime in the future. Well, why don't we pick a date? And why don't you do a little something for your book every day, even if it's 10 minutes, just jot a few ideas down and put it in a folder, call your book, because that way your book becomes an ongoing project instead of some kind of future hope or dream. You can convert it into a project and that starts to feel really good. And now you're thinking, I've got a book going on instead of someday I might write a book. Yeah. How did you uh how did you manage Steve to write 32 books? I think I counted like 19 books that you've uh, that you've written yourself and then 13 that you've that you've co-authored. How in the paddy wagger do you do you manage to do that? Well, um I I just didn't make it a big deal. I I turned it into a kind of blue collar enterprise. And so I thought, if I make it a big deal, I make it a big deal, and I worry about whether anyone's going to read it, then uh, I'm going to get stuck, and I'm going to think I have writer's block. But if I just do it the same way I would paint a room or shovel snow off the sidewalk, um, then I could I, I would not make it such an intimidating action. It would just be something I'm working on. And I found that when I did it that way, um, lo and behold, books would be started and finished. Oh. Oh. And when I, every book I finished, I really thought that was probably my last book. So then I would get an idea and uh, think that, that would make a really interesting, helpful book, maybe, so I'm going to do it. And did you go through that whole process of, of 
oh, I don't know if I should. Is this going to be any good? Will people like it? I mean, do you listen to those thoughts in your head? No, um, I let them pass through. I allow them to uh, offer their opinions and then move along. (laughs) <laughs> because they're they're not useful to me. I like that. Offer their opinions. Yeah, I I kind of think of thoughts uh, like like like, Mac, like McDonald's. You know, they come up to the window and they pass. And it, it's, yeah. it's only when I open up the window do I get to engage with one. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have to believe these thoughts. I don't have to think that just because a thought arrived, I have to take it to be the truth and. I have to focus on it and fasten on it and worry about it. If the thought doesn't isn't helpful to me, uh, I let it go. But that took that took time to practice and to learn that I could do that. That that's not part of my personality or anything. That's just a, a form of practice. Yeah. Now I I know uh, that your your friends with Michael Neal. Yes. And I'm taking his uh, – and you know what's really fascinating, Steve, is that a friend of mine uh, – by the way, thank you so much for Time Warrior. Out of all the books that you've written, that one has been so helpful for me. Mm. Moving away from I, – I was this type of a lad, Steve. I'd get up in the morning. I'd be in the office at 9, and I'd have 9 to 9.30 – 9.30 to 10.30, 10.30 to 12. I'd have every piece of the day broken down with something different. Uh-huh. And one of the things that I loved that I got from your book was, like, if you had to do just one thing today and do it well, or just do it, you know, what would that thing be? Mm-hmm. That has totally shifted the way I look at using my time. So now it's not, I'm not trying to, do a hundred things, trying to keep 20 plates juggling in, up, you know, at the same time. I just, I have one plate in my hand and I focus on that plate. Could you talk a little bit about, about uh, how you use time uh, more wisely, more effectively? Well, that was also uh, something I had to learn because I was the opposite of that. I, I had way too many things going on all the time. And I was very insecure about choosing which thing to work on. And anything I would choose, I would start to think maybe there's something more important to work on. And I would just run from one thing to the next to the next. And every day felt overwhelming. And I felt like I had a life where there was always too much to do and not enough time to do it. And, And through the work I did with my coach and some of the reading I did, I saw there's only one thing to do, and that's the next good thing. And and when I started approaching it that way, I saw that actually more got done when I slowed down and did things in priority, and I, and I focused on the one thing I was doing and didn't worry about anything but that. And then moved on, and it was just a different approach, and that's what led to the writing of that book. Yeah. Wow. Do you out out of all the books you've written so far? I'm, I know I'm sure there's more to come, Steve. What's uh, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite? I think the the newest book right now is my favorite because it's uh, very short, and people say it's very easy to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it has fewer wasted words than any of the other books. So right now, that's my favorite. Mm. In, in, in your book now, right now, Mastering the Beauty of the Present Moment, you talk about, and I love this, by the way, this was the thing that I got from your book, the, my little mantra, you know, make it magic, do it, do it now, make it magical. And uh, I, I, this morning, I got a great idea for this, for this uh, working with this company. Uh, I just thought it was a great idea. You know, I'm a life coach, and I also train life coaches online. And uh, I, and I started to – when I got the idea, I started this morning. I started to think, oh, maybe it's not Maybe it's not a great <laughs> – the thoughts came in. It was like, uh, I'll call her on Monday. And then it came to my head, Dermot, you know, 
as Steve Artisan says to you, do it now. I picked up yeah. the phone and I called I called my friend who is friends with the company to run the idea by her and to see what she would say. And she thought it was a fantastic idea. Now, I find it fascinating when I look at my life, Steve, how much of my life, like I wrote a little thing there in my book the other day, and it was something like, how much of my life has thoughts, has my thoughts stolen? Like, you know, Michael Neal and yourself, even in your books, talk about uh, living in the feeling of our thinking. Uh, yeah. and you talk about this idea in the book of uh, the question of what is the thought that kicks you out of heaven? Can you, can you talk a little, bit, a little bit more about that? Yes, and that's a, a question I got from, first heard it from Byron Katie. And she's a wonderful coach mm, yeah. and teacher, spiritual teacher. And you can watch hundreds of her YouTube coaching sessions uh, for free. They're on YouTube. And um, she asked that question, what is the thought that kicks you out of heaven? And it's a uh, under-the-radar kind of question, because when you ask a person that, I found it very interesting that people will identify with that thought for you. They won't argue with you and say, um, well, heaven is something you go to after you deserve it and you've proven yourself, or heaven is something we're all trying to get to, or heaven is an unrealistic ideal. If you say, what's the thought that kicks you out of heaven? People have an intuitive recognition that uh, without their negative thinking, they are in heaven. And the negative thought is the only thing that kicks you out. And, and when they see that in a flash, and they don't try to overanalyze it, but they simply feel the truth of that, it, it cannot change their lives. Because when they get another negative thought, like this person doesn't respect me or appreciate me, they can see that's only a thought. And I don't need to sit with it or take it as the truth or become depressed because of it, or think that it's the reality of life, I can see that if I believe it and dwell on it, it's going to change the way I feel about life. And that's not fun for me. And when I'm having fun, I do better work. I help other people more, and I have more energy. So it all falls together. Why do you think, Steve, we... we uh... We don't allow ourselves because I, I I like that about you. I notice like your uh, I I watched some of your uh, the the not so serious life on uh, on YouTube and I thought they mm -hmm. were brilliant. I, I <laughs> that's where I saw you wearing the hat. By the way, uh, <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to use that in my introduction. He's got a hat, forty four grand. There's diamonds or something in the hat. Oh yes, <laughs> well they're fake diamonds, and forty four grand is just kind of a joke, but uh, the hat was a gift to me. But the, the whole point of that show with the very brilliant Jason Goldberg as mm -hmm. the host of that show is that we actually accomplish more and are more creative when we're lighthearted and having fun. But there's a cultural tradition where we all tell each other we have to get serious. Yeah. If there's a problem in front of us, Gosh. now's the time to get serious. But the more serious we get, the less resourceful we are. Because now we're down the ladder and we're feeling down in the dumps and discouraged. And uh, when I'm feeling discouraged, my energy is gone and new ideas cannot come in. Yeah, boy, that. Why do you think, though, Steve? I, I, I'm laughing here because I'm thinking about the, 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 the quote from uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn: "If you if you obey all the rules, you miss all the fun." <laughs> why is it you think that we we don't allow ourselves to to play and have more fun? Is that a conditioning? You know, outside of social, you know, oh, you know, you've got to you've got to get serious about your life. But just in general, we don't seem to allow ours. I speak for myself. I'm more serious than 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 
playful, you know. Like that's why I do the show. I get to be playful one hour on Fridays. <laughs> Well, you could let that expand into other parts of your life. Um, I love it when I'm coached, and my coach is extremely playful. Because we rise up to uh, higher levels of creativity in that state. Come up with much better ideas, so we become more innovative, more effective. But in our culture, like you say, it's it's kind of a tradition that we trivialize play. Mm-hmm. We, we contrast play and work. And so we make play um, into something that um, is a postponement, a trivial, irresponsible activity. When the truth is, if we combine play with an intention or a goal to serve people, to grow a business, to come up with an innovative product or service, we go, we surge way ahead. We, we make really large advancements when we do it that way. Now, in, in terms of creativity, because you're, 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 you're a writer, you, you also sing and play the guitar, Steve, is that right? Yes. Uh, so you're doing a lot of different creative things. Um, do you find that the create the creativity comes to you, or do you need to go out and kind of look for it? Well, it's a combination of both. I want to create a situation in which it's welcome. Mm. And so you hear about various artists or business innovators who come up with product ideas or new service ideas that will serve people. You hear about them, they talk about how it it kind of came out of nowhere, or I was taking a shower and this idea hit me. And if we pay attention to that process, we're going to really notice that that's when the good ideas come in. They come from a higher place than the mind, the personal mind, personal thinking that tries to figure things out. Yeah, and it's interesting how how uh, my uh, myself included how quick we are to dismiss those those kind of whispers of ideas that we get in the shower, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You have a you have a thing in in, in your new book right now. Um, uh, who is stopping you? So we have you know right. we we all have things that we want to do. Uh, but we say, well, you know, I don't have the time and this and I have kids and I, I don't have the money and I don't have the confidence and I don't have the courage. And, you know, if, if, I, if I could do that, I would. I just don't have blah, 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 blah. What do you what do you say to people who who is stopping you? Is that a question that you, you ask in coaching? I, I often do because uh, people make up in their mind all kinds of limitations and restrictions. And they even say, oh, my wife wouldn't approve of that, or um, that that would never work, or my boss would never listen to an idea like that. And so they, they shut themselves down ahead of time before they even try things out. And if they adopt an attitude of discovery and exploration and adventure and curiosity, they they will test things. They will say, well, I'm just going to run this past my boss. I've got nothing to lose. Um, she might like the idea. And, and so it becomes more playful. And like you said earlier, um, rather than wait, why don't I just call this person right now and have it be magical and see where it goes? I've got nothing to lose. Yeah, see, isn't that the thing, Steve? We, for some reason, we think we've got something to lose. That's it. I mean, you nailed it. We've got something to, and the, and the truth is, we don't. <laughs> There's nothing to lose. You know? Right. There's nothing to lose. Yeah. And unless I'm really afraid of losing face, and I'm really afraid of not maintaining a personality that looks permanent and looks like I've got my act together. If I don't care that much about that, 
if I focus more on how much I'm serving others, how much I'm contributing, instead of how I'm coming across and what people think of me, then I can ask all kinds of things because because people begin to see that I'm only interested in contributing and making a difference and being of service. Yeah, that is beautiful. I, I I'm gonna we're gonna go for a quick station ID uh, and I'll I'll we'll be right back, Steve. I'm gonna I'll, I'll share a I'll share a quote to uh, to leave us off. If you're listening, everyone, you're listening to. Uh, KOWS dot FM on the uh, radio dial at ninety two point five FM for all you people driving around out there in your cars in Sonoma County. Uh, we're going to be right back. Let's play a little bit of music. Uh, I'll leave you with this quote uh, from George Bernard Shaw: "A life spent making mistakes is more honorable and useful than a life making nothing." We'll be right back with our uh, special guest, uh, Steve Chandler. So stay tuned. <coughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back. You're listening to KOWS.FM, 92.5 FM. We are Cows LP, coming to you from Sebastopol, uh, California. Yay. You're listening to the Celtic Coach Radio Show, an Irish talk show just for men and all things manly. Although there's a lot of ladies listening out there today. For some reason, Steve, the, the, the ladies think uh, that if they listen to the show, they're going to learn something about us. What, what, <laughs> what could you possibly say to the ladies out there listening, Steve? Hel- help them to figure us out a little bit. Yeah, I say more power to you. We're not as different as you may think. We're all in the same boat. We're all humans doing the best we can with what we've got at the moment. And when we start to appreciate that about each other, we can get along better and listen better and talk better. I uh, I was thinking this morning, Steve, you know, uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s, we had like uh, it, it used to be it used to be the fireman. Now it's the firefighter. It used to be the. The my old man now it's elderly, or the repair man now it's the technician, the cave man now it's the human. What do you what do you think's going on here? We 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 I don't want to say we've 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 moved from the fifties and sixties where you know men were nine to five and get the job done, and uh, we've moved into kind of now the 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 millennial space of 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 more of kind of well I'll do a little bit here I'll do a little bit about about that. How do you how do you look at man's involvement as uh, as through the years how they've passed and how they've changed? Well, I think it's um, by choice, and I mm. think it's evolutionary. I think it's uh, there's a spiritual evolution in the air, and it, men are being more inclusive and less exclusive, less hierarchical, less patriarchal, and less uh, exclusive. Robert Frost used to say that his least favorite word was exclusive. Mm. And and so, and I, and I think women have stepped up, become more powerful, made a bigger difference, and the language is attempting to uh, reflect that, accommodate that, so the language doesn't um, perpetuate things that aren't useful anymore. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of like when, when my little lady says to me, I say, what's going on, sweetie? How are you? Oh, nothing. That that to me means everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if she says fine, that means I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Now, you've been married for quite a quite a few years, Steve, and, and, and raised, uh, is it four four children? Yes. Yeah. What, uh, what would you say to the parents out there in terms of everything that you've learned from your own life? What uh, what parental suggestions or ideas or, you know, advice would you give to them? Well, uh, I don't want to complicate the parenting process. My job is to keep my kids safe, number one. And number two is to love them and, and give them the experience of 
being loved and supported and understood. And I think uh, generations ago, uh, parents really did not, with, with some remarkable exceptions, parents did not really try to do that. Mm. They were a lot more disciplinarian and strict and critical of their children. They were afraid that if they weren't extremely critical, that uh, the children would mess up and embarrass them. But I think you can be very straight and have good agreements with the kids, and, and but have the main theme be love and support. Mm, love and support, I like that. You know, it, it, it's uh, I uh, my old man Steve for many years uh, drank, and he, um, I left home when I was I left Ireland. Well, I left home when I was about fifteen, and then I left Ireland when I was about twenty something, twenty two or something. And I, I think up till about uh, twenty five thirty, I hated my old man, and and mm-hmm. I blamed him for my life not being. You know, didn't have a good life. My old man was was very wealthy, lost it all through drink. And so I blamed him for that for many years until I got to the point where I realized myself that all that blame was doing absolutely nothing for me and wasn't doing anything to him either. Actually, yeah. what he was doing for me was making me sick. What do you say to uh, what do you say to people out there that come from a background, you know, a rough, a rough background? And, and I know similarly for you, too. Um you know, and they're kind of playing that victim card of, well, you know, if I had a good childhood, if I had this, I had that, I wouldn't be such a, such a, uh, an S H I T. <laughs> yes. Well, um, it was helpful to me to see that the past is over and, uh, I may have some memories I bring back, but I don't have to believe that my, a uh, former experience in the past is going to um, now be what runs my whole life. It just doesn't have to work out that way, and I don't have to buy into the to the story that I'm a product of my own past. I can create the life I want starting right now, and that's what all of us have. Or I can not create my life and step back and and talk about my father and my mother. Both my parents were alcoholics. And I can talk about that and try to sell you my victim story and tell you that's why I'm out of action and not having a good life. And see, And hopefully you'll buy it. Now, for years, because of the world of psychology, everybody bought that. Everybody thought that um, who you were today was um, a direct result and that your past had an element of causation in what you're doing right now. And um, that's been proven not to be true at all. And that's the good news, that the past is over. If it exists, at all. It's because some memory we bring forward and give life to and revisit and give it new life and make it important and give it significance. And we don't have to do that. Yeah, I uh, I totally resonate with what you're saying. But, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to blame than it is to uh, take care of your own BS, like to actually look at it and... Yeah. It yeah. seems easier. Yeah. It, it sure looks easier, and uh, but in the long run, it's a lot more painful. Mm, that oh god, that is for sure. What do you say to people, Steve? Uh, you mentioned Byron Katie there. Uh, Byron Katie does uh, what's known as the work. Uh, what 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 would you say to people who you know are at least willing to uh, to let go of the victim card, or not even that? That's kind of harsh when I'm saying that. But what do you what do you say to people? What advice would you give to people who are looking to uh, grow their lives? They're looking to grow themselves. They're looking to step out of their story and 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 uh, and create a, a better life for themselves. Well, the first thing is to notice that all their energy, all their creativity, is. Um, 
not dependent on the past. It's living right now, right here, right now. And, and, and when I see that, when I see the truth of that and the reality of that, I can let go of the significance I gave my past and my stories about the past, which usually aren't even 100% accurate. When you talk to children who grew up in the same household, they, have, they all have different versions of what really went on. And uh, so not only is it not significant if I don't want to make it significant, but it's not even always very accurate. Yeah, I think of, you know, when I get down on myself or when I start playing that card, and, you know, I still do today. I mean, I'll be, I'll be bloody honest, I do. But uh, I, I think of, you know, if, if Viktor Frankl, uh, a man who was in Auschwitz, can be, can, can be happy and content in Auschwitz, then I think I can, I can, I can be okay in, 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 in Sunnyside, California for a day. You know what I mean? Absolutely. That's the beauty of people like Viktor Frankl, who've written books about his revelation, what he saw to be the real truth of how his mind worked, and that his happiness was not circumstantial, that it was in there all the time. And only his thoughts were getting in the way of his um, having a happy, productive existence. Yeah. What do you What do you say, uh, Steve? Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about thought because you, you you mentioned it a few times in your book. Um, and by the way, if you just joined us, everyone, you're listening to the Celtic Coast Radio Show. Uh, our special guest today, Steve Chandler, talking about his new book right now, mastering the beauty of the present moment. Um, what do you say to people? Look, I have a lot of friends, and all I hear from them, Steve, is Trump is doing this, Trump is doing that, la, 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 Trump is wrecking the country, he's wrecking my life, blah, 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 blah. Now, I, I don't mean to minimize that because I'm not a fan, and, and, and I do believe the man is out of integrity. Um, but what do you say to people that use that as kind of like a bit of a crutch to, to you know, I don't want to, I'm trying to think of a word, uh, you know, complain about the world. Well, um, it depends on the context. Now, if they are a news commentator and they are paid to give the opinions they have about current day politics, then uh, I find those opinions appropriate. But if it's just some person I meet in the grocery store who starts complaining, um, if if they really are interested in my experience, my experience is that um, if my favorite football team loses or if my favorite political candidate doesn't win and some other candidate is in there doing things I don't approve of, that's, um, that's a part of life, but it's such a small part of life compared to the beauty of the present moment in my family and my community. And um, if I could wake up to the reality, to the big picture, then, um, then things don't look so awful. And the other thing I say to clients who whine about circumstances, and, and you know this has been happening since the beginning of time, mm. uh, people in London were talking about the Germans, and then people here were talking about that, so it's not a new thing. That there are political that there are political things going on that people talk about. So my question is, what do you want to do about it? What's your creative response to it? Are are you j just going to complain? So it's like if you're playing tennis and you're upset that the balls are coming across the net at you, are you going to go lie down and cover your head and let the balls hit you? Or are you going to pick up your racket and hit them back and do constructive, creative things? What kind of a difference would you like to make to counter whatever injustice you see? Mm -hmm. So you can get into action and make a difference instead of just complaining. Yeah, and that action is not, is not just, you know, it can be something simple as just being nicer. 
It doesn't have to be sure. directed to that person. You don't have to go out and change the, you know, impeach the president or whatever. It can be something as simple as that, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. it can be very small. The old idea of a butterfly mm. uh, in China flapping its wings um, has an effect on the ecology of the whole world. So even small things make a difference. Yeah. Uh, puts people in a brighter mood makes them more optimistic and uh, those kinds of people will be more likely to vote differently next time around. So every little thing uh, is a positive difference. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you get bummed out, Steve? You know, when you look at the world, sometimes you think, Oh, it's kind of, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. How, how do you uh, experience well, that? Well, um, I used to get very bummed out about political things, yeah. and um, I like to look now at what's the opportunity here? What's a creative difference I can make? How can I support um, something that will move things in the right direction, as opposed to um, how loud do I want to whine about what's going on? I want, I'll either take action um, to counter what's going on, or, but I don't, I don't get bummed out by it. I'm, uh, it's just not a useful place to come from, a bummed out place. It's not necessary. Yeah. It's quite familiar, though, for a lot of people, Steve. Sure. It's easier to kind of be bummed out than it is to say, well, now how can I change or what can I do? That's right. And the, they're in the habit of taking their negative thoughts seriously. So if I have thoughts about things are hopeless, things are all messed up, why bother? The world is going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. Um, those are my thoughts. And those thoughts are what give me trouble, not the world. Yeah. And, and just for clarity, Steve, the people that we're talking about are are all the people who are not listening to the show <laughs> at any point right. today or down the future. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, that's great. Oh, wow. Yeah, see, I, I like that, Steve. I, I really like your attitude about that. Uh, you've coached people for a lot of years, Steve. What, what do you what, – what's – What's something, what's like a piece of gold that you've learned? Because I learn a lot by coaching people. What have you, you learned from the people that you coach? Well, I think the biggest thing I've learned is that people have wisdom inside them. They have access to more resources than they think. And so when I listen to someone I'm coaching and I hear their stories about themselves, and, and uh, they usually have a lot of negative opinions about themselves, a lot of regret or guilt, and, um, and, th and then they've put together a story, and they've made that regret and that guilt part of their identity. And what, what they don't see is that they don't have to do that. That's optional. And, and they can find out that it's optional very quickly. They don't have to go through five years of therapy or process every feeling they've ever had. They can wake up in a heartbeat. And that's the thing that's been the gold for me is to see how fast people can change. And that started for me uh, when I was recovering from drugs and alcohol and I used to go to meetings and I saw human beings in those meetings who were so down and out, and who, who had really messed up their lives, and um, they were broke, and their families weren't talking to them, and they looked sick and terrible. And I would see them six months later, and um, it was like a miracle. And, and that's when I saw that people change very radically, and and they change for the better very quickly, even though the world tells you that doesn't happen. The world and our culture tells you everyone has permanent characteristics and nobody ever really changes. That's that's the opposite of, of what I saw. So when I 
when I began to coach people, I could see in everyone I coached an unlimited potential for changing and for dropping all these beliefs they had about themselves. So any of this, any of these, uh, uh, and, you know, negative stories or I can't or, you know, that won't happen to me. You don't, that just, that's not on the radar for you? Uh, no, it, it used to be, though. I mean, I was worse off yeah. than it, <coughs> excuse me, I was worse off than anyone I was coaching. So I've been there. <coughs> I uh, I love the uh, we went out and watched that movie Steve after he, I you talked about it I think the Bill Murray meatballs in was it the Time Warrior or the Wealth Warrior Um I talked about that one in a few of my books Yeah yeah we went we went out and looked at it and it was great I'd never seen it my girlfriend just loved it uh, but one of the things in there that you talk about is it, it just doesn't matter and and you tell right. the story of of um, you know, when you were a young man, you had four kids and, and, and they're in the living room and they're banging on the pots and pans saying it just yeah. doesn't matter. We we had watched that movie a few times and there's a turning point in the movie where Bill Murray, Murray gathers all his campers together mm -hmm. and he tell and he tells them all these uh, negative victim circumstances they think they're in. And then he starts leading a chant. Even though those you might believe those things, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And so my kids loved that movie. And uh, their mother had a uh, very severe mental and brain disorder, and she was um, she was taken away and institutionalized. And so they were just left with me. Four children left with me to raise them. And because. Uh, we had had a kind of spirit about this. They had seen the movie, and after their mother was taken away, they went through the house one morning, banging on pots and pans, marching around, and they were yelling, and they were saying, uh, we don't have a mother anymore, but it just doesn't matter. And uh, our father doesn't know what he's doing, but <laughs> it just doesn't matter. And then they started yelling louder, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And it was a beautiful moment mm -hmm. because what they were realizing was that it really didn't matter and that life hadn't changed. The beauty of life hadn't changed. A certain circumstance had changed, but the richness of life, the opportunity of life, the fun of life, uh, that had not changed. And they could still have a great life. And that wasn't a philosophy for them. That was a realization in the moment. And and um, and that I remember lying in bed hearing them yelling, it just doesn't matter. And I was so happy because it sounds from the outside like that's kind of uh, nihilistic or r resigned. It's a kind of resignation that life, yeah, yeah. life is bad, get used to it. But it's the opposite of that. It's really a celebration of the fact that my thoughts don't matter. My negative thoughts don't matter. They don't have to have an effect on my energy, my optimism, my spirit, my creativity, my potential for adventure. They don't have to have any effect on that. So uh, that was something I never forgot. And I, I learned a lot from my kids uh, in, in their situation because I was so afraid that they'd be scarred for life and traumatized and the, 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 it, life wouldn't work out for them because of this, but, uh, they weren't seeing it that way. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Steve. Steve, we have about five minutes in the show left and, and this is the part of the show that I, I, uh, I asked the three questions. Would you be up for three little questions, Steve? Sure. All right. Number one, if you, Steve Chandler, if you had magical powers to change any one thing in the world, what would you change? You know, I think I would change uh, the way the University of Michigan recruits their quarterbacks. <laughs> My girlfriend would probably uh, agree with you. She's, she's from Michigan, too. 
Oh, that's yeah. Cool. All right. I can't think of anything um, because I don't know if I'd be changing um, something that in the bigger picture was designed for the good of all of us. Alan Watts used mm-hmm. to say, uh, when we get too close to what's happening, we can label things as bad that aren't. If And if we were ever to go down into a bloodstream and could see the white cells and the red cells battling each other, we would take sides. But seen from a larger perspective, it's all for our health. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I heard Michael Neal the other day say something to the effect of, it's not that life doesn't always work out well, but he says, it's all okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, number two, if you had to, uh, if you had, if you had to, Steve, uh, get a tattoo for a tattoo uh, uh, on your forehead and it, it had the secret of life, what, what would you get put on there? Oh, I think I would have slow down be put on there. Mm, slow down. But I might change that tomorrow, so don't hold me to that. <laughs> All right. Um, and number three, if you, uh, you're you at the end of your life, you get up to the pearly gates, what do you want God to say to you when you get up there? Um, we are having lasagna for dinner tonight. <laughs> Oh, you see, that's why I, I made sure in my intro to put Monty Python in there. Are you a Man- mm. Monty Python fan, Steve? Yes. Yeah. I would be surprised if you weren't. Listen, Steve, uh, your, your new book is uh, uh, right now, Mastering the Beauty of the Present Moment, as you as we wrap up our conversation here. So uh, people can go to stevechandler.com. There's also the Not So Serious Life, you and uh, Mr. Uh, Goldberg. Is James Goldberg? Jason. Jason. Jason, yes. yeah, uh, on YouTube. What else do you want to throw out there for our, for our listeners, Steve? Oh, that's more than enough. More than enough. Steve, thank you so much. Just, it's You're very an welcome, answer. Dermot. Thank you for having me yeah. on. I just knew this would be a wonderful conversation, and I, and I really appreciate it. And, and I know all the listeners uh, do too. Have a have a wonderful uh, weekend, Steve. And again, all the best to you, mate. Likewise, same to you. Cheers now. All right, you're listening to the Celtic Coach Radio Show, an Irish talk show for men and all things manly on KOWS.FM. F for Frank, M for Matilda. We'll be right back. That was our special guest today, Steve Chandler, talking about his new book right now, Mastering the Beauty of the Present Moment. Let's play an Irish jig, and we'll be right back in about, well, in about 30 seconds or so. So don't go anywhere. More Irish music to come. Celtic Coast Radio Show, an Irish talk show for men and all things manly every Friday on KOWS.FM. 1 to 3 and 1, one to three and one thirty to 2.30 are our interviews. Thanks so much for listening. Think big, have fun, stay curious. And my new little mantra is do it now, make it magical. Cheers, everyone. We'll talk soon.